Good afternoon, Aspire Nation. My name is Chris Yue. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you all and welcome to the Aspire Online Learning Program. Today's webinar is Acoustical Design for Healthcare Facilities. Before I bring up our speakers, I just have a few brief announcements. Uh, first, if you have difficulty with audio of this program, uh, you can send me a note through the chat with your email address and I can send you a link to a conference bridge number where you can listen with your phone. Uh, you'll be credited with one and a half HSW learnings for this webinar. Uh, please note only those that are logged into this webinar will receive CE credits. As a reminder, if you are an AIE member, this webinar is free and your units will be record, recorded for you by AI Atlanta. Um, Non-members paying for this program will receive a certificate of participation by email following this webinar, and you can keep your records and self-report. If you have questions during the presentation, we encourage you to use the Q&A tool uh, on your toolbar. Uh, as you see, all participant sound is muted, but you may type in questions at any time using the, the Q&A box, uh, which we will collect and ask at the end of the presentation. Lastly, before we bring up Steve Thorburn, um, Aspire Experience 2021 is in the works. So mark your calendars for September 14th through the 16th of this year, uh, and we hope to see all of you there. So let's get home and get started. Uh, our speaker today is Steve Thorburn. Steve, if you would kindly join us on stage. Okay, Lars, let's go live. Oh, there we are. Good to see you, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. Um, I will turn it over to you and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um... Welcome everybody. Uh, I am Steve Thorburn. I'm the design principal with Thorburn Associates. I hope you're having a great day today. Uh, we're going to be talking about acoustical design issues dealing with uh, well, the medical facilities. And I was told there's about 170 of you that have pre-registered. So evidently this is a hot topic. Uh, we'll be going through the different items, uh, comparing and contrasting some of the challenges we have. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, kind of the, the two low-hanging fruits, uh, HCAP and HIPAA, uh, and then we'll get into FGI, which is really the big dog on the block, but LEED and, to a lesser extent, Green Globes is coming along behind it, nipping at its heels, and uh, we'll go from there. So with that, let's get started, and we'll roll up our sleeves. So Thorburn Associates, we're an engineering firm uh, specialized in acoustical technology, lighting design uh, with many, many different market segments. We've got five offices, California, North Carolina, and uh, Florida. So uh, we've had fun working on a lot of bunch of projects over the last almost 30 years. Uh, as acoustical consultants, we deal with room acoustics, all of those things on the left-hand side, technology, uh, video, Zoom rooms, as we're all experiencing now, structured cabling, security, sound masking, paging, which we'll talk about more uh, at the end of the session, uh, lighting, lighting design, and then our theater consulting services kind of transcends all of those and blends everything together. This is an AICS uh, registered class, as you've heard, and uh, you should be getting 1.5 points or credits of health, safety, welfare. Uh, it is copyrighted, so uh, please use the ideas, but uh, let's leave it at that. Okay, so what does an acoustical consultant do? Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier on, but uh, room acoustics, how does that room sound? Uh, this is kind of the interior design for the ears. Sound isolation, how do we keep noise out from one side of the room to the next? Traffic noise, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. How do we keep that vehicle noise from impacting activities inside the building and outside learning spaces that we're seeing more and more crop up now? Mechanical noise control. How do we keep the building systems, uh, the chilled beam systems, the cooling towers, the emergency generator, all of those things from impacting the occupants within our spaces? Uh, with the mechanical systems, uh, there is a component of vibration isolation. This is something that as an architect, uh, you're not going to be uh, really dealing with. It's something that we will work with the mechanical team on and making sure that we've got the proper isolation. We'll see these services in auditoriums. If everyone thinks about acoustics in auditoriums. Uh, commercial spaces, uh, top right corner, a lot of gyms uh, working with uh, uh, one of the hospitals that's doing an expansion right now in North Carolina on, on their facility, and they've got a 
uh, a wellness center that is immediately above the ER. So that's going to be fun. Uh, corporate meeting rooms, uh, communication. How do we get the, the information out now? Housing, uh, multifamily, mixed use. How do we keep that sound isolation and impact noise from transmitting through the building? We've all had that first apartment out of college where someone was above you and all you heard was clickety clack all night long. Fun stuff for us, theme parks. We do a lot of theme park work, leisure entertainment. Uh, core of this session is medical. And what this does is it, it kind of makes us a jack of all trades and, and a master of a few, but not many, because we're touching all kinds of systems. We're touching uh, architectural, we're touching uh, from room finishes, we're touching walls and some structural systems, we're touching mechanical, we're touching electrical. So all these things we, we dabble in and have a great knowledge of when it comes to acoustics and how to apply those issues. So today, it's just a slice of acoustical issues. This is a very narrow, very myopic uh, view into detailing for an acoustical, uh, acoustical detailing in a medical facility. Uh, the session does explore um, FGI, HIPAA, LEED, Green Globes, HCAP codes and, and guidelines. We're going to review the codes and regulations and design guidelines impact impacted by acoustical issues. This is the only slide I'm gonna to read to you, I promise. Uh, we're gonna learn solutions for making buildings friendly for the occupants. Uh, we're gonna learn solutions for making buildings friendly for the environment. And then we're gonna have a bunch of case studies through here. So with that, if you've got questions, uh, drop them in the chat. We'll address them at the end of the webinar. Uh, as I was joking around with Chris, it's always my goal not to have questions because that means I've covered everything, but I know that's not going to be the case. So please bring on the questions and we'll have fun with them. So uh, why does this all matter? I, I, there's only one trip to the doctor's office that I know is a good feeling. And that's when you're bringing that little baby home. Um, that, that, that's everything else when I've gone to a doctor's office has not been a good experience. So we want to really make these environments as user friendly, experience friendly as possible. And acoustics is a big component of that. The challenge we have is we've got all these acronyms up on the slide and what group is really driving the design requirements from an acoustical point of view? Um, historically, uh, FGI has been, again, as I said, the big dog, uh, facility guidelines, and LEED has adopted a bunch of that, and Green Globe is now being adopted by VA, and we've got some pretty big opinions on that right now. So what is the minimum level of care that we're dealing with? Okay, that's going to be established by our inspectors, uh, JACO, uh, different societies, associations, uh, state and local building codes, but really it's, it's design guidelines uh, associated based on FGI. So we're focusing here on SAR, which is Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, South Carolina adopted the FGI guidelines in January of 2017. Uh, North Carolina adopted them as part of the building code, if you will, and I use that concept loosely, uh, in 2018, and then uh, start of first quarter 18, Georgia adopted them. So uh, all the states in SAR and in our region are using FGI as part of their building code for hospitals, um, and everyone's using the 2018 version. Uh, when people started, there was 2010, 2014, but everything is the 2018 version now. The guidelines were developed by a combination of AI and ACI, uh, American Society of Hospital Engineers, uh, a number of years ago. And it was really to provide a benchmark of having a reasonable experience within primarily a hospital, but it can be adopted for all medical offices, um, as well as outpatient, as well as assisted living. So it's uh, there as, as kind of that overall arching guideline. We start talking about HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accounting Act. Okay, it's really about patient privacy. And as we saw on the previous slide, 
we we talk about making sure that uh, conversations are are quiet so you don't understand what the person is is discussing with maybe the receptionist um nurse and doctor in an elevator don't say something they're not supposed to so it's it's kind of that loose lips she sink ships concept uh so we really want to make sure that we have speech privacy and that's what hipaa addresses uh we'll spend some more time talking about speech privacy as we go through uh the formal portion of sgi uh but it's it's a signal to noise ratio it's 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 how how hard is it to hear that spoken word that communication can you fully understand what's going on and what's being said uh in days gone by we've had great big spaces uh not too many awards anymore. Um, so privacy has become a little easier by nature, uh, except for when we get to nursing stations and other communal areas where folks are congregating and chatting. Lobbies, um, patient check-in. This is a big area we see when we're dealing with HIPAA and patient privacy. Uh, do we have a main reception desk at the at the entrance to the medical facility that, that's telling you uh, where to go, where's where, where's the different departments that you need to see, where someone might be? Um, do we have a glassed-in check-in space? Uh, what is that? My my hospital that or medical facility that I go to that's attached to the hospital. Uh, there's physically a sliding glass door. You walk in and shut the door um, and talk to the receptionist, get checked in, and then go about the visit. So there are there are different ways of dealing with this. Uh, challenges really occur at nursing stations because of uh, information being passed off between shifts, different things happening. Uh, now that we're dealing with uh, COVID, uh, we're gonna be seeing more barriers, but that's gonna make it also more difficult to communicate. Procedure rooms. Uh, big issue here is uh, multi bedrooms, nothing we can do about that. That curtain is only going to do so much. Uh, procedure rooms, what's being heard on the other side of the wall? And this talks about the STC rating, the sound transmission class. How do we address uh, the transfer of sound from one side of the wall to the next? How are we dealing with the doors and making sure that they're acoustical sealed? So in a short, uh, did Max have the cone of silence? Did that solve the problem for HIPAA? Uh, in many cases it would, but again, it's just proper detailing. And, and HIPAA really is kind of the tail on the dog right now. Uh, when we start dealing with FGI, Lead Healthcare, Green Globe, uh, HIPAA falls in line. HCAPs, uh, quality of experience. This is where uh, a patient, their family gets to rate the hospital uh, on how well the experience was. And acoustics is one of those points. Um, I think it's 18 points or somewhere in there that uh, so can impact the amount of money the hospital gets back from the federal government. So that's what the HCAP program is, is, is a way to account, have the hospitals account for the quality of care and the money they're receiving from the federal government. A number of years ago, I was able to attend a presentation uh, uh, by Sue Ann Gilderman. Uh, excellent presentation uh, out, of Minneapolis, uh, out of Minnesota. She was talking about the reports that are required for after action reports for, say, a slip and fall. And trying to figure out how to prevent those, uh, what were the cause of those. And what she found through her studies and, and going back through all the different projects or issues was it all got down to sleep deprivation. Uh, it changes the mood, the cognitive changes, napping. It created a high number of fails and um, agitation. So sleep deprivation uh, in the nursing units that she studied where they were having slip and falls was really the number one issue that they tried to solve. So it got down to noise. Uh, in their case, at night, they were able to reduce the volume or turn off uh, beepers, uh, indicators. Uh, they were duplicated, so they had them at the nurse's station. And that improved the, the person's sleep quality. They noticed that uh, in nursing homes, folks closer to 
the cafeteria, those units uh, had more noise as people were walking to uh, the cafe to, to get lunch or have a cup of coffee or whatever. So site planning and room layout uh, is important. We start looking at this. What is that traffic path? Uh, had a, a dear friend, uh, a medical architect. Uh, she was dealing with her mom in the hospital and her mother's bed her room was near the elevator, but for some reason, there was an expansion joint between the elevator and her mother's room, which was the first room in the corridor outside that elevator. So every meal cart, everything that was wheeled in there went over that expansion joint as clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack. So that noise, while very much unattended, uh, it wasn't a beep, it wasn't an enunciator, it was just the process of delivering food and other materials to the floor that created that problem. Now, honestly, from an acoustical point of view, I don't know if I would have caught that on the drawings. Uh, it's not a detail that we typically look for. Um, I don't think of expansion joints as a noise source. I typically think of them as a noise reduction path because the buildings are no longer coupled. So any structure borne noise that's in the building stops at that expansion joint. So it's something to be aware of. And this is where we need to work and rely on the rest of the design team and say, hey, Steve, do you realize we've got an expansion joint here? Is there something we can deal with that? So getting into the meat of this presentation, um, FGI, uh, hospital guidelines, LEED 4.1, LEED 4.0, uh, vastly improved upon the acoustical credits uh, within lead, the previous versions of lead. Lead equals FGI. Lead asks for everything that is in the FGI. FGI goes above and beyond the requirements that lead has adopted. So you need to understand what your client is looking for. Are we just looking for lead healthcare? Uh, is the state uh, architect, our uh, medical medical inspectors, medical folks, um, and I'll just leave it at that because every state's got a different name for them. Um, are they requiring full FGI compliance? So it's, uh, who again, who's driving that ship? Okay. So LEED 4.1 adopted FGI guidelines in part. Uh, 2018 uh, is healthcare facilities. There are nursing homes and, and other components of this that can be used for outpatient offices, things like that. There is no prerequisite for acoustics in LEED 4.1 for healthcare. There are two possible points. One is for speech privacy, sound isolation, and background noise, so everything inside the building. And then the other one is for acoustical finishes, which would be room acoustics. And then this is kind of the weird one, uh, environmental noise levels. How do we control planes, trains, and automobiles, uh, other things from getting into the building. And that is also another point option. So site noise, um, here's a chapters and voice verse from FGI. I'm talking about exterior noise. Uh, that's part of lead option two. Point two, uh, it's existing exterior noise, and then it's also the facility noise. So do we have a central plant and what is the noise emissions from that central plant on the adjacent neighborhood? What are the noise emissions uh, on that central plant from uh, the end of the building? Uh, design criteria, the room acoustics, the reverberation time, the echoes, uh, that's the acoustical services. That's also part of option two to get that, that point. Uh, background noise levels, room noise levels from mechanical systems, from uh, medical equipment, that's part of option one. And the design criteria for walls and floor ceiling constructions, that's option one. Speech privacy is option one. And uh, Lee doesn't talk about design criteria for building vibration. Green Globe does not have a specific healthcare set of guidelines. It's just lumped in with Green Globe. And quite honestly, I got a big problem with some of the stuff Green Globe is asking for. They are way too strict. And if we have to follow these, our buildings are going to be way more expensive. Now, let's kind of go through some of that. So we've got uh, 
FG on the left, FG and including globes on the right. Uh, talk about STC 50. I see green globes is mandating. And this is what I don't like about guidelines is they're mandating specific performances where give me the, what the goal is, give me the requirement and let me deal with that because that STC 50 wall may need to be 55. Uh, or maybe we might be able to do 35. Uh, a big, big thing here is going down is doors. Uh, an STC 50 door is an, you know, last time we priced them for a standard 3080 is about seven grand. Why do I need an STC 50 door into a quiet space, which is classified as a patient room? Um, yeah, we want to make sure the noise levels inside that room are fine, but I mean, this, this is going off the deep end, guys. And the stuff we're doing for VA right now, I mean, the, I don't know where it's going to go to. Uh, for some reason, we go down to IIC. Uh, I'm kind of jumping around here. Uh, FGI doesn't uh, deal with that. IIC is the impact rating of the floor ceiling systems, uh, floor ceiling system. Uh, IIC 50 is what we'd associate with market rate housing. Uh, generally, in a commercial building, we're going to have better IIC than that because of the thicker, in this case, uh, typically uh, um, concrete slab construction. Background noise? Yeah, kind of, kind of analogous there. Uh, exterior noise? Again, they're dictating specific isolations of walls and windows. In many cases, we may not need those. Now, this is also an issue with FGI that we're going to get to uh, when they start talking about uh, exterior noise. Uh, room acoustics, they're dealing with Green Globe is, is a, reached out and used uh, the ANSI standard for classrooms, uh, which, is, which is respectable. It's good. Uh, FGI, not so good when we start talking about room acoustics. Uh, their values, I think, are, are too low when they start talking about room absorption, uh, room coefficients. And then other requirements. Um, Green Globes talks about all the building systems, lighting, plumbing, having to deal with air, and uh, FGI talks about vibration. So that, that's kind of the, the soapbox version. Hey, all, all in favor of Green Globes. I think overall it's a better solution. We started looking at the points and things uh, compared to LEED uh, as far as addressing issues. When we're dealing with LEED and we're dealing with Green Globe, it's very important to let your consultant know early on what's being applied for because how we make our recommendations and the paper trail we create will make it much easier for the points to be uh, gathered, the paperwork to be uh, dotted with the I's and the T's crossed. So let's talk about our environmental noise, planes, trains, and autos. For FGI, um, they have a, both a prescriptive and descriptive solution to the noise emissions on the site. Now, part of the reason why I don't like this is our buildings are multifaceted. And we just think about the typical rectangular building. I know, dull and boring, but hey, I'm an engineer. Uh, we had one of these for Kaiser. And on the north side of the building was a freeway off-ramp. So it was a flyover type condition. It was a ways from the freeway, but it was coming down from the freeway uh, about a mile and then landing onto surface streets. So that was to the north, one exposure. To the west was an airport. Literally across the flyway was the, the parking deck for the airport, concourse, and then air runway. To the south was an open field, no noise sources there at this time. And then to the west or to the east, we had uh, a building that was three stories taller and more expansive than that elevation of the hospital. And it was providing a tremendous amount of shielding. So on one facade, I had, I think it was 65 decibels predicted at the facade from the tra traffic. Uh, airplane was 70, somewhere in there. And then we had 45 on uh, the building side, that the taller building, and we had 50 on the other side. Instead of just telling me what the background noise level needed to be in our adjacent different spaces, they're telling me that I have to have an outside inside transmission class, OITC, which is similar to STC. Uh, 
and these ratings need to reduce the exterior noise into the building down to 30 to 40 decibels is what the math says. Now, as we go forward in this, we're going to find out what those background noise levels are actually being asked to be. But instead of just telling me, hey, Steve, we've got a design to this NC level for all the patient rooms and this NC level background noise level for all the exam rooms and then our public spaces is this. No, they're telling us what we have to do for our building and that's gonna be more expensive generally uh, in the construction price uh, process uh, if we just follow or have to follow these uh, specific comments. So we're talking about environmental noise. Uh, we use something that's called A weighting, DBA. So uh, acoustically flat is the blue line. So every frequency is at the same volume. When we provide a filter or a weighting curve for A weighting, we roll off the low frequencies and we roll off the high frequencies. So we're only really concerned about the, the sibilance of my voice, the words we're saying. And that goes from the 500 hertz octaband up to the 4,000 hertz octaband. So going across the bottom, that is the frequency range. The left, as you're looking at this, is the very low range, uh, 31 and a half hertz, 31 and a half cycles a second, up to 8,000 cycles a second. And then we have our amplitude uh, from zero, in this case, up to 80. Now, my voice, if we're talking right now in this room measuring it, would be about 65 decibels. So 65 dBA as I'm around a conference table talking in a meeting. Uh, to give you an idea of why, why we picked that point. So we can see that we're rolling off the low frequencies quite a bit. Uh, this became, because we're not as sensitive to low frequency noise. As we evolved, we were more sensitive to the hiss of the saber tooth tiger that was about to pounce on us than we were the elephant stampede a half a mile away. And that's, that's from Dr. Evanson in my acoustics class from about 45 years ago. So uh, it's not an original, but it's a good analogy. We started looking at the, the wavelengths that we're dealing with. Uh, a wave of 20 hertz, 20 cycles, that's the very low end of our hearing range as newborns. That wavelength is 50 feet long acoustically. So I think about a C wave. And from trough to crest to trough, that's 50 feet. At the high end of our hearing range, at 20,000 cycles as newborn, that wave is about a 16th of an inch, or let's see, one third of an inch. And that's about the size of my little fingernail. So our ear is a very, very wonderful tool when it comes to hearing things, but we're not sensitive to the full range. We're just really sensitive to, to the speech range. And for the male speech range, it starts at about uh, 200 cycles, so that 250 hertz, and it goes up to about, eh, I can squeak out 4,000. Uh, the female speech range is a little higher than that. So it's shifted up. So how loud is your sight? Uh, different acoustical measurements can be done. Uh, again, looking at A-weighted sound levels, Things are documented for, for longer periods. Uh, the graph on the left is uh, a 24-hour measurement outside of a medical facility in downtown San Francisco. And uh, if you've been to San Francisco, you know there's a lot of one-way streets. Uh, from this, we can tell that this is a one-way street uh, going in in the morning because that where it bumps up in the morning there, those hours, uh, that's the traffic coming in. It close, goes down at night. And then in the morning, it's a one-way street in. So site planning. Um, looking at a major hospital replacement complex uh, that we were able to work on, uh, two major roads, uh, medical offices, buildings, parking decks, residential. And we ended up adding a, a helipad there that was part of the central utility plant, uh, loading docks. What are all these different sources when we're dealing with the noise and how do we imp uh, shelter the residential units? Okay. Uh, for the parking deck, well, we were able to use that as an acoustical buffer. We were able to close off uh, plan south wall. So that helps with a lot of the traffic noise. And the, the central utility plant, the loading docks, those were all uh, not subterranean, but they were down a level. Uh, so they could back directly into the, uh, the basement area of this building. Uh, for the helipad component, uh, everything on the southern facade uh, of the uh, hospital uh, the, that's there overlooking that area uh, required special glazing. 
So what are our issues? What are our environmental impacts that our facility is placing upon itself? Are we dealing with helipads? Are we dealing with life flights? Is it ambulance runs? What is it? Uh, is it just an occasional transfer helipad or is it a uh, ER, uh, life flight trauma facility where we're having those come in on a, unfortunately, maybe hourly basis or whatever it might be, but multiple times a day. Generators, um, testing of generators. Okay, a generator noise is exempt when it's being used for emergency operations. When we have to do our exercise or our testing, it's not exempt. It's a noise source on the project. So where are they located? Um, are we testing them all? If we've got multiples, can we test them one at a time? Uh, can we get that as a sign off as an operating procedure? Or are we gonna have to put them all and, and do a full load test with, with all three or four generators running at once? Um, every time we double the number of sources, we increase the noise level by three dBA. So we go from one to two, that's three decibels louder. We go to four, that's six decibels louder. So that, that's a, um, an impact that is very noticeable. Deliveries. Um, how are we dealing with the loading dock? When, when are we picking up trash? When, how are we screening that? So the, these are different issues. Uh, VA hospital we're working on right now. Uh, loading docks in the back. We've got all back of house stuff that's overlooking the loading dock. So we're pretty good on that. So uh, that was a great layout that we got for that to start with. Uh, there are some, some issues. Uh, we've got a few offices, but they're further down the building facade. Uh, but the main loading dock issue is, is being uh, treated by mechanical and uh, the two stories of the associated area. And then we have the fun. Okay, this is a, a medical manufacturing facility. It was built first. Um, in this chiller pit, we have three cooling towers and uh, two chillers to address uh, the manufacturing process. And then lo and behold, up above on the hill, they decided to build townhouses. Now uh, the fun of talking on webinars was always that tickle in the back of your throat. So it's, it's the, the, then this became an issue for the manufacturer. And they were there first. The, there were some noise issues. So we had some variable frequency drives that are, are a pain acoustically for us uh, because the way they chop up the electrical wave and how that's then heard in the motor, the motor starts to sing. Um, so we ended up having to come up with a very expensive barrier uh, on that wall that's in between the, the house and the chiller. And the biggest expense was the foundation. I mean, structurally, that wall, that, that wall that's there now was approximately 14 feet tall. And to block that line of sight from those houses, we had to go up another 10 feet. So not only was there the weight, it became a big sale for wind loads. Uh, so it just, proper prior planning. If we can look at the drawings early on, uh, just from a quick point of view, just from our point of view, uh, there's a lot of things that we can suggest, not all of them are gonna be possible, but rearrangement, looking at different options so these things don't happen. One of the big things we wanted to do for environmental noise is conduct some baseline noise measurements. So if we are in a, in a truly urban environment, uh, we know how loud the site is before uh, construction starts, before the project starts. That gives us something to fall back on. Say, yes, this already had this much traffic noise there. Uh, we didn't add anything to it or we added a decibel, which is a negligible impact. How will that sound uh, impact the surface? Are, are we putting a helipad on top, top of the roof of the top floor of the hospital with patient rooms right below? I mean, that's gonna become a very expensive roof. One project, uh, when we started talking about what was needed to meet FGI guidelines for patient in rooms below from the helicopters, uh, quickly decided to move the helipad to an adjacent building, um, parking structure. Uh, what are the walls gonna provide? What are the windows gonna provide? 
how are the building systems, uh, central utility plants, uh, different rooftop units, how are all these going to impact the building? So this is part of the uh, exterior noise takeaways. Oh, little fact, uh, fun fact. Uh, at the end of this session, uh, we will be giving you the URL for these slides. It is a hidden hidden link on our website, so you're not going to be able to find it if, unless you stick around. So that's what all those gold stars are for. Those are the big takeaways. Those are the things you want to have uh, pinned up on your, your office wall. So we talk about environmental noise. Now, the other part of uh, the credit uh, for Lita Healthcare for that first one is room acoustics, uh, room finishes. How do we make sure that the room sounds appropriate? Uh, this is a hospital that we worked on and what we're calculating here is the reverberation time. Okay, how long does it take sound to decay? Now we started looking at it, this with all the glass, the gypsum board, uh, the rock, uh, the terrazzo floor, had an average absorption coefficient of about four tenths of a Sabin. Okay, one Sabin is an open window. So any sound that strikes it keeps going. So this is four tenths, very, very reflective. And it had a reverber rever reverberation time that we calculated in excess of three seconds. At that long uh, calculation kind of falls apart. So within, FGI, they start talking about what the overall average room coefficient is. So for us, we would take the, uh, the absorption coefficient of the gypsum board wall. We would take the absorption coefficient of the floor finish. Maybe it's carpet in some areas. Uh, maybe it's linoleum. We would take the absorption coefficient of the ceiling. If it's acoustical, that's good. And then we take that total surface area, multiply it by the appropriate absorption coefficients, and then come up with a room constant, this design constant. And again, some of these are good, but I, they're, they're really low in my opinion. Uh, we start talking about uh, atriums, a tenth of a second. So that lobby, uh, or, or a tenth of a co, a tenth of a Sabin, that lobby was halfway there. I mean, so let's just round it up to 0 0.05 Sabins. Adding another half a Sabin in that atrium, that lobby area, is not going to significantly reduce the reverberation time in there to some place where a person could communicate. Okay. So as we're looking at this, it's, it's based on what's called the noise coefficient. That's instead of the Sabin, but it's, it's that average rating. So reverber reverberation, okay, it's just sound bouncing around the room. So every time a sound hits and interacts with the surface, it gives up some of its energy and it decays. And what we're looking by the definition of re reverberation time, is how long it takes sound to decay 60 decibels or to one millionth of its original sound level. And the Walter Clement Sabin spent a lot of time uh, at Fog Hall and at Harvard trying to figure this out uh, and is re really the father of, of architectural acoustics, interior acoustics. So the, the equation in RT60 is 0.05 times the volume times divided by the uh, design coefficient. Uh, so there is a lot of engineering and science behind this. Uh, we've got a huge database of, of different products um, and, and go through this and, and provide the recommendations. So this is why you see our office recommending you need a thousand square feet of this type of material. There are lots of materials that could meet that requirement for an NRC rating, uh, for an absorption rating. It's, it's letting you as the designer uh, select what you're looking for. We're perfectly happy to make recommendations, but it's your building, it's your aesthetics inside. Um, and as I say, you don't want me picking things out because uh, Lisa, my wife, has to dress me in the morning. So we talk about absorption coefficients, um, NRC, noise reduction coefficient, Sabin of one, uh, perfect window, open window, again, sound that goes through that open window. And just like the Energizer Bunny, it just keeps going and going and going. It doesn't reflect back into the room. Uh, an absorption coefficient of zero, it's totally reflected. So that'd be a very thick concrete wall. That would be a thick metal wall, something like that to reflect all that energy back in. So we're looking for a blend. So if we were looking at something, a design coefficient of 0.1, 
that's a fairly reflective surface. When we start thinking about a typical ceiling tile, uh, the, the, the low end acoustical tiles are 0.65 and the high end tiles are, are 0.9.95. So I mean, a tenth of a saving for an absorption coefficient for an atrium uh, is not gonna be a very pleasant space. Start doing the calculation. Um, and again, NRC, I can play games with, with NRC. I can play games with a lot of acoustical things. So we're talking about an average, the noise reduction coefficient over the speech range. And if we've got a low frequency absorber, something we'd use in a theater, um, it's much more absorptive at the low end versus just going out to Home Depot and getting one of those special developer tiles that they've got. <clears throat> Both of these products have the same NRC rating, but they perform very, very differently. The low frequency absorber is going to get rid of the boominess. The Home Depot acoustical tile ceiling is going to get rid of the hiss, the high frequencies. Mounting conditions is very important when you start looking at tests and we're going to get to the fact that you only want to use products uh, if you don't have a consultant involved that, that you can actually understand how it's been tested. And ASTM, when we're measuring absorption, we throw down to 100 square feet of material on the floor of the test chamber. And if it's type A, then the edge is exposed. So that adds more thickness, more surface area. So if it's a one inch thick material, got a hundred, well, got 40 linear feet, 10 by 10 by 10 by 10. So we've got an extra um, 40 square, whatever that math works out to be, uh, 40 linear feet, uh, a few more square feet. So it's just not hundred square feet. Uh, we've got other things where top mounting type C, where we've got a finished product on the end. Mounting type D, there's a little bit of an airspace behind it. When you start looking at acoustical tile ceilings, they talk about E4,400. <clears throat> so that's a 400 inch or 400 millimeter uh, plenum space is how it's mocked up. So that mounting depth is 400 millimeters. So the effect of the acoustical material and how it's mounted is very important. So if we were just to take a, a standard acoustical tile ceiling and glue it onto, this, onto the wall, this is a, can't we just glue on an acoustical panel? Um, this is what we would get. Very poor absorption in the low frequencies. Again, 125 is the low frequency. Zero is that totally reflective. One is the totally absorptive. And we have an NRC rating of about 0.65. Very effective at one kilohertz, right, right in the center of the speech range. Take that same material and drop that in as a ceiling in the E400, we pick up a lot of low frequency absorption. This is the reason why I like acoustical tile finishes, um, acoustical panel ceilings. It doesn't necessarily have to be tile. It gives us a lot of low frequency absorption and that same material gives us another uh, 10 points to up to about 0.75 for the absorption coefficient. So how materials are mounted is very, very important as is the thickness. Same thing here. We've got a one inch thick panel versus a two inch thick panel. And in this case, uh, we can see that the two inch thick panel when tested is much more effective at the lower frequency absorption. And here looking at Tectum's data sheet, um, you can start to see they're, they're giving you that information. They talk about one inch thickness, inch and a half thickness, two inch thickness, and then they also talk about the mounting conditions. And as we can see that if we have a, a uh, D20, it's 70%. If we have a C20, it's 95%. And if we have a C40, they're claiming it's 100% absorptive. That's with the two inch material there. So we can look at that both from a, a thickness point of view and how we get more absorption as well as a mounting condition, airspace behind the panel. Be very, very careful. Uh, the image on the right claims, uh, uh, this is one of the FETS products, uh, the, uh, the recycled plastic. The, it's a great product. I, I like it because it's, it's color safe all the way through. We can do different things with it, but be careful on how things are, are represented to you. That a thin material like that is not going to be an acoustical barrier, nor does it have any absorption capability. We think about it, okay, my little finger, nail is at the upper end of the absorption up the upper end of our, our hearing range. A wavelength at 20 hertz is 50 feet long. How is carpet, how is that thin material going to interact with something that's that's even 10 feet long, a wavelength 10 feet long, uh, which is the start of the voice. And we can see in the image on the left, 
Um, again, they're playing around with some different shape, uh, thicknesses and shapes and making it look like draperies, uh, again, for, for different acoustical absorption characteristics. But make sure you get your data and know how it's measured. Uh, when the acoustical felts came over a couple of years ago from um, Europe, uh, all the reps were saying how great they were. They are touting these high NRC ratings, uh, absorption ratings. And we started digging into it. Well, they're trying to sell it as a wall covering. So a really thin system. And the way those were tested was actually with a deep airspace behind them. So uh, if you're not using a consultant again, make sure you understand how things were tested. Okay. And 400 millimeters is about 16 inches as we start looking at, at different tests. All right, so the big takeaway, understand what was specified, confirm how it was tested, and where are you going to be placing this? Are you going to place it directly on the wall or is there going to be an airspace behind it? Mechanical noise control, fun stuff here. Uh, building noise systems. Uh, FGI is talking about what the maximum noise levels are yeah, in both NC levels and DBA. Uh, we've got the different equipment, what they're expecting for patient rooms, what they're exp expecting for other areas. And as we can see, there's a wide variety of noise levels. And this goes back to that interior to exterior um, gripe I had earlier on. If you just told me you wanted something that was NC40, I can design a system with exterior noise based on the exterior noise profile to meet that noise level. It's going to be much easier, much cheaper than just dictating that I've got to have an STC 50 or 65 envelope. So background noise levels, it's a series of equal loudness conduer, conduits or contours that were established in 1957. Um, so yeah, just a little bit older than I. And We've been using them since then. Now, there are other options for RC and PNC. Well, it's taken us since 1957 to get mechanical contractors and no offense, mechanical engineers to understand what NC rating is. Um, it's one of those things that ain't broke, don't fix it. We really wanna make sure that, that people understand things. And if, if we meet these NC ratings uh, and see the lower the number, the quieter the space, uh, we, we've never had a project uh, fail because they met the NC ratings. Again, that's something we're going to be addressing with a mechanical engineer and mechanical designers. Uh, it's not something that's really going to be, um, other than giving us maybe some shaft space and, and other things uh, that's going to be within the architectural uh, purview of a design. Sound isolation, this is a big thing here. Uh, what is that performance of that wall? What are we putting into a head wall? When sound strikes a surface, one of three things happens. It's either reflected back into the room. So that's our room acoustics, our echo. It's uh, absorbed, if you will, by the wall through damping and internal vibration, or it's re-radiated on the other side, much like a, a sounding board on a guitar or piano. Uh, the more that we can damp out, that's the STC rating, uh, the better off we will be. Uh, you'll hear a term called noise reduction. Uh, that is the measurement of noise from one side of the barrier to the next. That is everything. That includes the ceiling, that would include the wall, that would include the doors. Uh, you can kind of think about it as uh, analogous to a fire rating. So the higher the noise reduction, the greater the acoustical barrier, uh, the higher the fire rating, the greater the, acoustic, the, fire, the, the fire protection. Uh, sound is blocked by mass. So this is where we like to have CMU uh, reinforced grout filled. Uh, we understand that that's not possible on, on higher buildings, taller buildings, a lot of mass, a lot of weight up there that's going to be moving around. Uh, we can also block that same amount of energy with lightweight partitions that are separated by a large space, large airspace. And this is where we start looking at double stud walls, eight inch stud walls, different things like that. Sound transmission loss is the measurement of noise reduction across the frequencies. And it's a laboratory measurement. Uh, what happens now is uh, we, we put that into a lab, we measure it, we document what that level is. When we measure it out in the field, it could become a parent sound transmission class um, or the older metric was noise isolation class. Start looking at the STC ratings of different walls, kind of go through the wall food chain. Um, the, these are coming from USG 
designstudio.com. So there's a lot of information out there, but again, you need to know that how, how was it tested? Are you really looking at what was tested? Uh, there's a lot of uh, UL issues uh, with tests. Now from a fire rating point of view, uh, if you make a slight modification to our partition, uh, you can get a say that it's a one hour rating because it's based on the similar partition that doesn't track acoustically. So just because a partition has the same apparent UL rating, it needs to make sure that it's actually been tested acoustically. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, uh, go back to our YouTube channel. I think in our master class, uh, Thorburn Associates uh, at YouTube, and we talk about the fire rating and, the, and that apparent uh, issue. So looking at wall types, uh, the top left wall type, um, single stud wall uninsulated, that's about an STC 30 wall. As soon as we add bad insulation, it becomes a 35 wall, um, maybe 40. Uh, an extra layer of sheetrock, 45, maybe 50. Uh, again, this, 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 uh, the hemming and hawing in my voice is depending on how thick the wall is. Is it a two and a half inch metal stud? Is it 24 inches on center? Is it 16 on center? Is it three and a half? Is it four inch? I mean, there, there's some different variables, but basically we get a five STC point as we build things. Uh, if we got four layers, typically that's an STC 55. That would be my typical go-to wall around conference rooms, different things like that. Then on the bottom, we have what we jokingly call our mega shaft wall, uh, which is a, a six inch uh, CH stud, um, fire rated shaft wall. Uh, furred in from that is a, uh, another wall. And what that gives us is an ability to have a very noisy elevator mechanical shaft next to a, a doctor's sleep room. Uh, lots of text here that you can read uh, when, when you get the handout. I was just talking about the various uh, issues with sound transmission, uh, noise reduction, and giving you all the footnotes associated with FGI. Sound masking there, we'll talk about later. That's been pulled out of this section, but it, it helps uh, uh, in dealing with patient privacy when we're dealing with exam spaces. So an example of, of detailing and how we would be looking at things, this is a VA project from many years ago. Uh, and we actually start looking at what wall types do we need. Uh, the project was gonna have sound masking. So the entire area had sound masking. So we created a uniform sound field. That's the benefit of the sound masking system. As you've experienced buildings, when you're near the core of the building, it's much noisier because of the fans, the ductwork, all of that. When you're on the perimeter of the building, if it's in an urban environment, we've got all the traffic noise. Uh, so that creates uh, louder spaces. And when we're in the center of the building, it gets quieter. So by having a uniform noise source, noise level throughout the building, um, that, that sounds like HVAC noise, uh, it helps us out. Then we can go through and just and work on uh, the spline wall between the exam rooms. Okay, that's a full height wall. Uh, the party walls between exam rooms, that's a full height wall. Uh, we don't want ductwork penetrating those. Uh, but because we've got a door in the wall, uh, because we're going to have um, open plenum return, it gives us the ability to, to stop that corridor wall six inches above the grid and um, allow for that mechanical open plenum return, allow for... Uh, duct work to get into the room so we're not penetrating and breaking our expensive acoustical walls. So coming up with a detail of, of something like this to help color cord, coordinate what needs what our needs are acoustically. Doors. Um, I, I, I grew up uh, when Star Trek uh, was first shown and I was a big fan of teleportation. Uh, beam me up, Scotty. Yes, beam me into a room. Make sure that room is sealed airtight. Best thing we could possibly do. Start dealing with our doors uh, and the sliding doors. Uh, this is a challenge. Uh, most of the sliding door systems out there, let's just say politely, need a lot of improvement. Uh, there were a few more adjectives coming to mind, but we'll just say just need improvement. Uh, when we slide, we need a gasket. Um, the head, uh, how do we gasket the, the, the hidden jam? How do we gasket the, the handle jam? I mean, where are those closures at? Do we have a drop bottom? Uh, the manufacturer showed here is, is probably one of the better ones that we found out there. Uh, but doing some prep work, just making sure that all, all my apples were 
in the cart today. Uh, went out to their website and their door is claimed to be an STC 34 door, which is good. And it claims to have an NIC, a noise isolation class of 39. That is physically impossible for a door to have an STC rating because that's the laboratory test and then have a field tested rating of 39. What that 39 represents is what's called the composite rating of the wall. And that's testing the door and the wall. So the door itself, again, this is not clearly called out on their documentation. And it'd be very easy for you as a designer to say, hey, I got this STC 39 door. We're getting close to getting green globes. Uh, but no, it's the whole combination. And that goes back to that green globes of, of rating of 50. Well, let's, let's look at the right com composite rating. So when we're dealing with sound isolation, we assume uh, slabs are deck-to-deck, uh, -deck, uh, sealed airtight from an acoustical point of view. Penetrations are caulked. Fire ratings on walls are our friends because if smoke can't go through there, nor can sound, nor can air. Uh, cavities are insulated with loose fill materials. The cheapest way to improve that STC rating, we went from 30 to 35 on that first slide just by adding bad insulation. Acoustically in sound isolation, there are no silver bullets. A 1% air leak will take your wall down by 20 STC points. So I've seen the guys from favorite background office music take their screwdriver and through our acoustical wall, get up on top of the ladder, jam it through the gypsum board so they can run a wire through it. They didn't even want to drill. And that breaking of the gypsum board, what they did there was totally destroyed the acoustical rating of that wall that we're trying to get to. Walls that do not run full height are STC 35 at best. That area above the plenum is gonna create our weak link and it's gonna limit us to STC 35. I have tested this many, many times. I'm not gonna say hundreds of times, but many, many times. And it's always in the low 30s. So that was STC, that was sound transmission, sound isolation. So let's talk about speech privacy. We talked a little bit about it earlier, um, how we're dealing with it. It's a challenge for us when we're dealing with um, check-in. Uh, we like to have sound absorptive material from the bottom corner there uh, on the wing walls as people are checking in, kind of that old telephone booth effect if anyone's out there old enough to remember telephone booths um, and, and spread out uh, check-in spaces for nurses station. Speech intelligibility uh, is the ability to understand the spoken word in architectural space. We want to be able to hear that emergency announcement in the airplane of uh, in the architectural space. Speech privacy is the corollary, is we do not want to have people overhear that conversation. So when we're dealing with speech intelligibility and speech privacy, we've got a talker, we've got a path, my mouth to your ear, to the listener. And speech intelligibility is to communicate information. Follow the red line to the next department. Follow the blue line. This is where we want um, our guests to interact with the receptionist in the uh, medical facility lobby, uh, be able to communicate. Speech privacy is to keep information private. So this is where I don't want to overhear what's going on uh, in the exam room next to me. I don't want to hear, in this case, the dentist drilling on somebody else's teeth because I don't like that. So we're trying to keep information private. Uh, FGI has got a great table uh, full of metrics. Uh, some are old, some are new, basically dealing with the same thing. Uh, speech privacy potential is the easiest way to look at it. Uh, again, this is all the, the footnotes and things associated with it. Uh, articulation index has been around for a long time. Speech intelligibility index has been around for quite a long time. Um, what we use is, is a simplified version of this in our corporate work is speech privacy potential. These cannot be calculated ahead of time because it has to rely on the background noise level within the room. We can assume that if we have our correct NC rating and we have our correct absorption coefficient, what those are going to be, but it's based on the, the articulation of the talker, the source of noise, as well as all of these built conditions. <clears throat> so speech privacy potential, um, basically we take the background noise level 
add the noise reduction, in this case, the STC rating or the composite STC rating to come up with our speech privacy potential. So if we have a background noise level of NC35, which is the typical office, and we've got our STC55 wall, uh, 35 plus 55 is whatever that is, 90. So that would give us our kind of our confidential uh, speech privacy, which is why I like it around exam or around conference rooms. We start talking about open plan offices or maybe that wall that only goes up uh, through the ceiling grid, that STC 35 wall, it's partial height. And then we've got um, an NC 40 space. So 35 plus 40 gives us 75. Well, kind of normal speech privacy, but what happens with normal is if I sit and listen, I'm gonna hear words. Okay. So if I sit and listen, I'm gonna be able to understand what's being said. Confidential is where you can hear utterances and you may hear an occasional word, but you can't understand the meaning. And marginal is, is goes down and poor and none from that point of view. So this is an easy way for us to look at what that speech privacy potential is that what we're gonna get. Sound masking. Soapbox, again, and if any of you know me, I, I, I like to get up on the soapboxes and I'm not afraid to let my opinion be known. I love sound masking. We've got sound masking in our office. It's great. It does a wonderful job of improving speech privacy. In this case, we've got two different systems. Uh, one is an engineered system, very similar to what we would design. It's been being designed by acousticians for, for years. The other is a bunch of marketing hype. Um, We've had this product in our office to review. It is, it doesn't create enough volume. So the red curve is as loud as it gets. The blue curve is, is, is very easy and comfortable for the system to do. The red curve, it doesn't extend down into the low frequencies of the building. And what we want to do with the sound masking system is we want it to make it be a ghost. So people don't even think it's there. Uh, when it's turned off, facilities gets a call and says, hey, the mechanical system's off. That's what we want it to sound like, and be uniform throughout the space. That's the reason we have the extended frequencies. So the, the crosshatch curve is, is the masking goal that we have. The upper end would be for uh, open plan offices. The lower end of the curve is more for private offices, uh, exam rooms, things like that. So be very, very careful about these things. Uh, again, they, these are relative to scale. Uh, the Cambridge system uh, now being marketed by, uh, by AMP is a teeny tiny little loudspeaker. It doesn't have the physical capabilities to make extended low frequency energy versus an eight inch loudspeaker is much what we do with that engineering engineered system. Uh, we start looking at the acoustical performance. Uh, again, for the, the QT, it's, it's just getting up there. And uh, for the, the Atlas, we can go a lot louder. This talks about, this is kind of an open plan issue, but talks about the benefits of sound masking. We had the opportunity for uh, one of the financial companies uh, to document with and without sound masking, with low cubes, with high cubes. So they were in the process of converting this entire floor from, from high cubes to low cubes, the 42 inch cubes. We're able to measure with sound masking on and with sound masking off. And these are equal loudness contours. So what you see on the right, the, the colors are, are the same. It's, it's, think of it as a, a, a survey contour. So with sound masking on in the top left, we can see that that lighter green blob is smaller. The, the other levels are smaller in size <clears throat> excuse me, than what we see at the lower level. So that's the benefit, the effect of a higher partition. So that's the top and bottom of the left-hand side. Then when we go to the right-hand side where we've got the darker colors, that's the effect of sound masking and no sound masking. And we look at the bottom right corner, look at how far out into the space that word, those utterances are being heard compared to the top left corner of the image. Um, 
it's just much less impact. And that's really where the benefit of the sound masking occurs. It's not next door in open plan offices, but it is in larger areas down, down the hall. So again, when we put this into um, exam rooms, much more effective. So as we look at some curves, um, the curve on the left is speech potential. Uh, it talks about the human speech range, whether we're talking an average level, sound level, or shouting, and it gives us an idea of what the contours are. The curve on the right is that sound masking contour, and you can, can see that they, they track one another to a certain point. Um, they're there to help cover over the spoken word. It's not a design build solution. It needs to be commissioned. So please be very, very careful as you're specifying this. Uh, there's a lot of good intentions out there, but uh, unless it's commissioned correctly, it's not going to work and it'll be turned off. Uh, the sound masking system typically are loudspeakers located above uh, the ceiling. Uh, they shoot up into the deck above um, to help distribute the sound. In the case of the other systems, they actually are hung from the deck and they shoot down. So again, you got this cone, tiny cone of sound versus this wide cone of sound based on the reflection off the ceiling. Speech privacy, the takeaway here, full height walls are the best. Sound masking can really help. Uh, and when it comes to sound masking, understand what's being sold. When it comes to all the acoustical issues, understand what's being sold and what the, uh, not to speak poorly of people, but what is the motivation. <clears throat> Getting down to the home stretch here with building vibrations. So get those questions in. You know, this is something we'll be working more with uh, the mechanical team. Uh, making sure that uh, the mini split systems are properly isolated, the large cooling towers are, are mounted off from structural steel. Um, uh, the image of the yellow isolators, that is a cooling tower that's on the 14th floor uh, of a high rise. Uh, so the, it's the roof deck above the 14th floor. Cooling towers are all supported by columns that run all the way down to terra firma. So there's no uh, lightweight load on the roof deck. Uh, vibration criteria, uh, th this is a velocity. This is something we'll work with a structural engineer on uh, based on footfalls, uh, the vibration, making sure that we don't have uh, that experience that you have quite often in airports of people walking down the concourse and feeling their, their footfall as they walk. Uh, vibration criteria curves, VC curves, very similar to noise criteria curves. Uh, they're used, uh, primarily we're looking at these for MRIs, uh, the lower the curve, the lower vibration. A lot of the MRIs we're dealing with are requiring VC, C, VC, B, uh, depending on uh, how sensitive those are. Uh, doing a study for uh, MRIs, uh, going out, documenting what the existing vibration levels were. Uh, in this case, do we have uh, uh, too much ground borne noise? This is a, a concern with an ambulance uh, coming into this parking lot here, and they're putting in a new MRI, and was that going to excite the, uh, blur the image? That's the problem with, with vibration and MRIs as the image gets blurred. So as things become more sensitive, we're dealing with electron microscopes, whatever it might be from a research point of view, uh, the building has to be fairly stout. And we typically want to keep imaging on the lowest floor. As we bring imaging up into the building, uh, the building becomes much lighter and is in you know, more opportunities for it to be impacted by uh, noise. Coordination, um, again, acoustically, I'm asking for full height walls. Uh, mechanical engineers, ductwork, plumbing don't like that. So we need to make sure that we're coordinating uh, the raceway down the, the building hallway. Uh, looking for noise criteria, sound transmission and speech privacy, all of these things are taken care of or need to be addressed uh, when we're dealing with uh, architectural acoustics and mechanical noise control. Big challenge here is acoustically, we can integrate all this stuff uh, within FGI, within lead healthcare, within Green Globes to a certain extent. Uh, HIPAA, HCAPs are all going to fall along uh, for the, they're going to tag along for the ride uh, from an acoustical design point of view. And uh, it is possible. So let's not charge at windmills and make it tougher. 
So now we're going to open up to questions, and there's the magical URL. If you stuck around long enough, uh, you can go to our website, ta-inc.com, backslash healthcare2021. Uh, later today, you'll be able to download, um, at least tomorrow morning, you'll be able to download the presentation uh, in the slide deck, so you've got a record of all this going on. If you've got questions, you can reach me at steve.thorburn at ta-inc.com, or you can reach me at steve at ta-inc.com. Either one of them works. Uh, just say, hey, Steve, uh, attended your healthcare lecture for uh, AI Aspire. I've got a question. Be happy to answer them. So with that, let's open it up to questions. Great, Steve. Thanks so much for this wonderful information. Uh, we do have some questions come in during your presentation that I will get to. But for all of you that are still with us, um, please use the Q&A or the question answer box to submit your questions and we will get to as many as we possibly can. Um, we're at about 110 now, so about 20 minutes for questions. Um, so while people are pondering what to ask you, Steve, um, the first question that I had uh, comes from Mitchell Baker. Uh, they, they ask, how do you really address low frequency noise transmission? And I guess to qualify low frequency, the talking about the 20 hertz to 250 hertz. So the best way for us to deal with that very, very low uh, noise uh, is through a combination of mass walls. So some type of concrete, grouted CMU, and then a furred gypsum board lightweight assembly uh, an inch out, a couple inches out with a couple layers of gypsum board. Many, many years ago, did a TV studio kind of analogous to this. Uh, their goal, they were back-to-back -back studios. Uh, they wanted to have tax talk being recorded at one, so one side of the PBS studio, and they wanted to be able to tune a Harley on the other side. So that wall was an eight inch CMU wall. And then off from that was, it was for a one inch airspace. We had a three and a half inch metal stud. I think it was three and a half inch metal stud. It might be a little thicker given the height and then two layers of gypsum board with bad insulation in there. Something like that is what's going to be needed to deal with that really super low frequency. Now, the other issue is, is it really that loud at low frequencies? Typically, this would be an emergency generator. Uh, it might be a cooling tower. Are there ways for us to address that issue uh, at the source? Um, I'm lazy. Anything we can do at the source of the noise uh, is going to make treating it a lot easier um, from that point of view. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, if we can't deal with mass and what we can deal with, um, and if we can look at a couple of, uh, uh, of very thick double stud walls, uh, going to maybe possibly a couple of shaft walls uh, so we can have them separated by an airspace, but there are ways around it, but it's gonna call, take either mass or a footprint of the building to solve that problem. Okay, what's next? Sorry, sorry, Steve. That's all right. I'm, my mute button got stuck there for a moment. <laughs> um, another question that comes from Catherine Bidette. Um, she was asking if you could kindly repeat the human voice range that you referenced earlier in your presentation. Sure. The, the, the human voice range, um, my voice, if I really, really work at it, I can get down to about 180 cycles. So that's 180 oscillations. Uh, male range, we typically says is about 200, 250. Uh, I can get my voice, if I really try and get really squeaky, uh, I can get up to just about 4,000 cycles. The female speech range goes from about 300 cycles or 300 hertz up to around 5,000 cycles. That's, that's where the most uh, intelligibility sibilance uh, that we deal with is. So uh, telephones from days gone by, um, uh, Bell Labs, uh, when they were establishing the original telephones, uh, determined that the communication bandwidth that we used was from 300 cycles to 3,000 cycles. So that's kind of where the vast majority of the intelligibility, the sibilance uh, of our voices is at. Good question. All right. Now people are, people are getting brave. Okay, let's see. Um, next question uh, I'm sure that you are happy to answer is, when should architects bring you in on the project? 
when should architects bring us in? Uh, as I alluded to, um, getting us in early for a quick set of, of, of another set of eyes um, to identify, do we have environmental noise impacts? Do we have uh, planning issues, room adjacencies? Uh, you all are great at doing those things, but if we can look at it from a separate set of eyes, uh, a half a day review can save you guys can save the project a lot of money if we have that opportunity to move things around. Awesome. Uh, next question comes from Michael Rowell. Uh, he asks, how effective is placing insulation on top of acoustical ceilings in a typical office where the walls stop six inches above the ceiling? Michael, do you want the polite answer or the correct answer? Generally, what we say all it does is piss off IT. Um, very early, it, it's not effective. Very early on in my career, one of the first projects I got to work on was a laboratory remodel for IBM Alderman out in San Francisco. And at the end of the, the lab bays, they had storerooms. They were growing so quickly, they needed to convert the storerooms into offices. The labs were making too much noise. The researchers were complaining. The wall between the lab and the uh, storeroom extended six inches above the ceiling. We did the inverted T. So um, for, first we did bad insulation on both sides out eight feet or so. Measured that, no change. Then we did the inverted T, measured that, no change. We packed the entire plenum with insulation. One STC point change. So it's, it's a great marketing gimmick that USG, Owens Corning fiberglass has had for a long time, uh, but it's just not effective and we don't recommend it. Now, with that being said, excuse me, um, if we're trying to control reverberation, we do suggest putting bad insulation on top of the acoustical tile ceiling. Because what happens, is if we think about that thickness of our tile and that airspace, all of a sudden that ceiling tile that's a half inch, maybe one inch thick, if we lay bad insulation on top of that, that sound wave that's going through that ceiling strikes the deck above and comes back down. If you remember that slide, that just that material just became much thicker. So not only do we have the thickness of the airspace, we've got the benefit of thicker acoustical materials. So the low frequency performance is much better. So from a sound isolation point of view, speech privacy point of view, I don't waste the time, don't waste the money on it. From a room acoustics point of view, uh, when we're dealing with auditoriums and other large spaces, yeah, it's very helpful. Good question. All right. Um, this one is about STC rating. So I will do my best to relay it to you. But Steve, if you have the opportunity, if you have the ability to maybe perhaps open your question answer box um, as well, it probably would facilitate. Um, but this question comes in from Ken. Lars, can you open my question and answer box? So this question comes from Ken Yamuchi. Yamuchi. Um, any medical environment, healthcare clients like heavy gauge metal studs, 18 gauge at 16 inch OC, what is the STC rating of a 18 gauge metal stud wall with sound insulation with 5 8 inch gypsum board? Um, I guess acoustical sheetrock seems to be an expensive option to increase the SEC rating. And Ken wants to know your thoughts on the matter. Did he give us a stud thickness? I was looking at the pop-up at the uh, uh, He said uh, 18 gauge at 16 inch, I guess. 16 inches on center. Okay, on so center, yes. Okay, so let's, uh, it's a great question. Um, as we go up with heavier gauge studs, that starts to perform more like um, a traditional wood stud because it's so stiff, uh, as you've, you've guessed. Uh, 16 inches on center, uh, it's a stiffer wall than a 24 inch on center. And then the thickness of the stud. Uh, at 18 gauge, a single layer of gypsum board on each side, insulation, say it's a four inch stud, that's gonna be about STC 45 because of the stiffness. Now, if that was a light gauge stud, we might be able to get that up to STC 50 or very close to that. So that's five STC points of trade-off. When we add another layer of gypsum board to that, we're gonna get between three and five points 
on that wall improvement. If we add a second layer on the other side, another three to five points. So th this is how we can go through this. And there's lots of great test data that we have access to um, that we can look at for that. Um, acoustical gypsum board. Uh, sound, not sound break, um, Quiet Rock was the first one that came out. And when that first came out, there's a long running joke in the acoustical consulting community. They claim to be five or eight times more efficient than standard gypsum board. The only thing they were eight times more was more expensive. Uh, if you go out to their website and look at Quiet Rock, again, these are the, the original folks who developed it, has some of the original patents. They have taken down all their acoustical test data. Uh, they never did round robin. Okay, this is a standard gypsum board wall with and without. Um, they just said these were additive solutions. Um, National Gypsum's Sound Break, if I got that name right, I've got too many products in my mind right now, but National Gypsum's acoustical, uh, acoustical gypsum board that is a laminated system. Uh, their test reports, uh, I believe they've been done by a great laboratory. So when you start looking at acoustical gypsum board, yes, it's more expensive. Yes, it does help in certain things. Um, but generally I can get to the same place by just adding more layers of gypsum board. And what we would do for critical areas where we have multiple layers is we'd get the first layer up, smear some uh, acoustical or some construction adhesive uh, or damping compound uh, on that first layer laminate the second layer up and then we're basically gluing two layers together through the screws uh they're being bonded together by the construction adhesive and it's creating kind of a gypsum board plywood like thing so we all know plywood is a lot stronger than the same thickness of dimensional lumber uh same thing happens with gypsum board or with with gypsum board and acoustical detailing so i hope that helps uh increasing stud spacing or stud depth Going from four inches to six inches will give us a couple of STC points. So it's all a game, but unfortunately, it's, it's going to be a trade-off in uh, floor space. But good question. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next question is from Liz York. So uh, the situation that she has outlined is they have a set of six conference rooms with an open plenum above and glass windows in the walls between some of the rooms. Um, and their complaint is there's a great deal of sound transmission between these rooms. Um, they are considering placing sound blankets above the ceiling tiles and boots in the docks. Um, look, Liz asks for your opinion, are these likely to help? And have you seen anything really effective in reducing sound through windows? Reducing sound through windows, uh, glass conference rooms, um... Normally, I would say get a brick and throw it, throw, throw it through it so we can rebuild it. Um, but knowing that's not an option, uh, but it may be the option. When we're looking at glazing, uh, be it side lights, be it any type of glazing uh, in conference rooms, we start with laminated glass. Laminated glass is a form of safety glass, so we're fine there. We can do that, that trade-off. And the last I was told, laminated, laminated glass was roughly the same price as tempered glass for the same thickness. Three eighths inch laminate is STC 35. Now I wouldn't put that between conference rooms. Again, my, my favorite conference room wall is that STC 55 wall, four layers of gypsum board with three and a half inch metal studs insulated. But we can look at going to quarter inch or go to a half inch uh, and even go to, to an insulated window there if you truly want the glazing so you would have to change out the storefront system i'm assuming it's a storefront system between these these conference rooms um, but the glazing change out would be something that i would start with above the head of the the wall since it's an open plan and return um, above each of those walls i would either reconstruct a gypsum board pony wall uh, above that or use some type of of acoustical vinyl that you can hang down from the above and let it drape down and get that sealed air tight to create that barrier up in the plenum. Then yes, using uh, return air boots out into the corridor would be very beneficial. So I don't want to return from one room to the next room to the next room. I want to get that return from uh, the conference room out into the corridor from that point of view. And glass, um, everyone likes that, that great glass uh, conference room being able to see in, but it really hurts us acoustically.
Hope that helps. Good question. All right, we have five minutes left in the webinar. So um, just have a few more questions. Hopefully we'll be able to get to them. But um, if not, I will forward any questions we were not able to address on this webinar to Steve so that he can reply to you guys um, via email. Um, so the next question I have for you, Steve, is uh, how effective is sound masking in classrooms that have standard walls, uh, that is two by six studs with five and five eighth inch gypsum each side? And then a follow up to that is how much does it cost per thousand square feet space? Sound masking is running about a buck and a quarter, a buck 50 a square foot. And I would never put sound masking in a classroom. I would never put sound masking in a conference room. Those spaces are there for the communication of the spoken word. Sound masking artificially raises the background noise level. So we're covering over some of the nuances in the quieter passages of my voice. So for that case, I would wanna make sure that the mechanical systems are, are properly designed for a low noise environment and that the walls are designed to keep sound out. So it's, it's sound masking and, and, and communication spaces is, is, in my opinion, a big no-no. Awesome. Uh, next question we have is from Virgil. Virgil wants to know, how do you feel about high density GWB with laminated metal like quiet, quiet rock boards? High density gypsum board with quiet rock. Um, again, we kind of talked about that a little bit with the the, the sound break uh, from National Gypsum. Uh, there is a place to use it, um, but I'm I, you want to make sure you're looking at that round robin reports of this is what that true test report has. Uh, that's what's nice about National Gypsum. They've got that data. They share that data with you. So in its place, it's it's a good solution, uh, but there's also a lot of marketing hype around it. Fair enough. All right, Steve, uh, I think this will be our last question. Um, How many more do you have? Uh, this is really it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unless someone sends one in under the buzzer. Um, but the last, the last question we'll take for the webinar is from Pedro Nera. Uh, and he asks you to kindly briefly review the issue with the control joint and adjacent patient room to the elevator. So what happened in that case, um, Kelly's mom had gone in for whatever it was, and she was in that room for two or three days uh, recuperating. And there was the control joint that was someplace in the hallway between, let's say, the elevator and her room. I, don't, I, I thought she said it was the first room around the corner from the elevator. Every time a cart rolled over that control joint, there was a click clack or a thump that startled Kelly's mother when she was in that room. So thinking about having smooth transition floors, this might've been a case where simply going to a different type of wheel instead of a hard wheel, if we could have changed, if they could have changed it to a, a pneumatic wheel, uh, that might've taken some of the issue out, but it, it's, it's addressing that noise source that didn't need to be there necessarily. Uh, maybe it could have been a different uh, transition cover uh, between the two surfaces, but it was that impact of the tire going over uh, the speed bump in the hallway, if you will, uh, that, that made the impact and the noise that Kelly's mother was hearing. And think, think about it as, as, as literally having a speed bump. We just did a, another project in Orlando here last week, and we we're dealing with speed bumps in the parking garage that was going to go below, which was above uh, some training facilities that were going to go in on the first floor uh, area. And it truly was. Every time a car went over that speed bump, it was a very loud, jarring noise uh, that was disruptive down, downstairs. Same thing. Excellent. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, all of our members are singing your praises. They really appreciate the, your presentation and your um, succinct, succinctness and um, in delivering this information to everyone. Uh, for everyone that's still with us, if you look in the chat message, we did um, throw up the post for the masterclass on YouTube. Uh, if you want to just click on that link for, your, for you to re reference later on. Um, as a quick reminder, you will receive one and a half HSW um, for all our live program participants. These will, units will be reported 
automatically for your to your AI transcript. Um, just look out for them for the end of the month. Um, if you also just, uh, we have another Aspire online webinar next Thursday. So uh, please check your local or state chapter um, for that information about our next Aspire online webinar. Um, Steve, I wanna thank you again for your time uh, in addressing this important material to all of our attendees. Um, with that, uh, we wish everyone a great rest of the rest of your day. Uh, once again, thank you so much for uh, being a part of uh, today's webinar. We hope you learned a lot and uh, hope to see you at our next Aspire online session. And also remember Aspire 2021 is this fall, September, 20, September 14th through the 16th. So hope to see many of you there as well. Um, without further ado, I will let everyone go about your day. Great day. Thank you all for having a great day. Enjoy yourselves.